Royce Hart has been described as Richmond's Tasmanian Tiger. Much discussed, but rarely seen. Given his inability to travel, we took open mic on the road to Hobart. In 1996, a panel of experts named Royce Hart centre half forward in the team of the 20th century. The best player in 100 years in the toughest position on the football field. Royce Hart, why aren't you a legend of this game? It wasn't my decision, Mike. Are you surprised that you're not? No, not really. I didn't think about it that much. I felt honoured to be named centre half forward in what you termed as the hardest position in the ground to play. 11 seasons with Richmond, but you packed a heap in, didn't you? I mean, it's a surprisingly short period in the modern era, but uh, there were four premierships, five grand finals, lots of accolades. It was a, a stellar career, wasn't it? It was the best part of Richmond's um, existence in the VFL, AFL and, and continues to be. But let's go back to the start. You're a 17 year old young man in uh, Hobart, Tasmania. Richmond shows interest in you and decides to go after you. You decide to go to Melbourne at the end of 1965. Pick up the story from there, Royce. Well, before that, um, Graham Richmond had come down here to see me play, and he arrived, arrived on the Saturday, and we normally played our under-19 football down here on a Saturday morning, but had been transferred to the Sunday, and he sat down with my mother, and I was working in the Commonwealth Bank at the time, and Mum said to Graham, uh, he hasn't got enough um, clothes to go to Melbourne, and Graham said, I'll give you six shirts and a suit. Six shirts and a suit. Now, that's part of football folklore. Was there 20 quid attached to that? I didn't see it. You didn't see it. <laughs> so, so, but there was no bartering. I mean, you were happy to do that. There was the opportunity to play AFL football that uh, just said, well, I don't care what we get, I'm going. Well, it was the next step on. I hadn't played senior football down here, but I'd won the best and fairest in the association. And I felt that I could play at a better level and the best level was VFL football at that time. Did you take from Hobart when you, I mean, it was called the mainland then and there was a bit of a sort of an inferiority complex in Tassie about young people here going and making their way in the mainland. Did you think that you'd succeed or were you just going to sort of say, look, I'll take my chances and see where it takes me? Well, I didn't even know where Richmond was. When, when I saw Rich in front of it, I said, that might make me rich. <laughs> and I didn't have a clue where Richmond was, but I wanted to play at the top level, so I went. First year, 1966, you started in the under-19s under Slug Jordan. You finished the season on grand final day playing in the reserves. Pretty tight game, wasn't it? That's right. There was about 20 seconds to go and I took a mark, I say now, about 60 <laughs> metres from goal. It could have been 20. And Barry Teague, who was a uh, young rover in the Richmond seconds, came up to me and I, he said, for God's sake, kick a point and we'll draw. I went back and I went through the goals and we won. So how far was it, do you reckon? Oh, I was getting longer. <laughs> Big torp. You loved torps when you came to Melbourne, didn't you? Yes, that's all I could kick. Yeah. The following year, you're playing in the first, 1967. It's your first year at, uh, at the VFL AFL level. Your first game's against Essendon. You kick 3 7. That's right. What transpired after that? All with torps, too, weren't they? All with torps. Yeah. And yeah. after the game, um, I sat down with Graham Richmond and Tommy Hafey, who Tommy was the coach at the time, and they said, You'll have to improve your kicking. So I decided that I'll kick a drop punt, and I didn't know much about drop punts. And no one did in those days. There was no kicking coach. So I decided to base the drop punt on the same theory as what a drop kick, only kick the ball before it hit the ground. And I started kicking drop punts from then. And I know, I know what your tra training regime was like, but were you working on that during the 67 season or, or between seasons? No, I worked on it during the 67 season. Like, as I say, there were no kicking coaches and you had to devise your own method as to what to do. And that's the method I used. So 3-7 in your first game, disappointment, they're frustrated with your kicking. We go to the fast track it to the end of the season. You play in the grand final. Richmond wins its first premiership in 20 years. You kick three goals. You're the recruit of the year and you kick 55 goals for the season. I mean, you wouldn't dream of having a first year like that, would you? No, it surprised me a bit, but it didn't just happen like that. When I first went to Melbourne, I went into Frank Sedgman's gym when the Pope Stan Nichols was a head instructor there and I worked on the weights for, say, all the uh, off-season to, to, to go from 10 stone 12 to 13 stone 4. And um, that's what I had to do, but I did a lot of work. And one of the first players, one of the first groups of players, and I remember Kevin Bartlett being in that group, working on weights. Mm -hmm. And now all players these days do it. Now, I want to take you to 69, Royce. I mean, it's the most extraordinary season that I can remember. You're in national service. That's right. You're based between Sydney and Adelaide, is that right? I went to Pakapunyal for 10 weeks. Yep. 
and then went to the School of Artillery in Sydney and then went to Adelaide, Woodside. OK. So you hook up with Glenelg, the South Australian Tigers, you do your training there, you fly back to Melbourne on the weekends to play. I trained one night a week at Glenelg under Neil Curley. Right. And then no fly nights back. in Melbourne? I'd fly back on Friday night and come back to South Australia on Sunday night. At the end of the 69 season, you win your second premiership and you win the best and fairest in a premiership team not having trained with your team. Well, the, the theories and what was going on there were thrown out the window because there was no special diets, there was no training with your teammates and it just worked for me. You might have been right, mate. You might have been a unique player. <laughs> <laughs> Which takes us to the book, Royce, the famous book. Uh, the book. You were commissioned to write a book at the age of 22. You've had four, four years in the system. There's lots of it were fact or fiction about you picking yourself, picking yourself in your best ever team. My understanding is you were asked to name a team that you would like to play with. Like to play with, yes, and that, that was right. An actual fact. I remember a headline that Alf Brown, the chief writer for the Herald, had in the book review saying, Royce Hart's head's that big, he's not taking marks anymore, he can't get his arms over his head. <laughs> You seem to be sort of so matter-of-fact about this. I mean, has this not worried you over the years that people think that Royce Hart's a big head, uh, how could a bloke pick himself in his best ever team? I mean, I know it's a misconception, but uh, that was what most people thought happened, wasn't it? No, it didn't worry me at all, because uh, what you said was right, the players who I'd like to play with. Mm. Some people took offence, it didn't worry me. Let's go back to 67. You've played four games with the Tigers. You're uh, 19 years of age. You get selected in the second Victorian team to play, I think, come back here to Tassie. Like that. Yep. Ron Brassie pulls you out of the number one team and you're elevated to play for Victoria after four club games against Western Australia at the MCG. That's right. Played on Colin Beard, who was later to become the fullback for Richmond in the 1969 Premiership side. Ended up kicking seven goals, and I think at the other end, Big Bob Johnson, I think, kicked seven, six or seven. Were you surprised how well you went? First up in, in Melbourne? I was always confident that I'd do OK. But, Why? Uh, Why? Well, I had the athletic ability to be able to handle it and uh, I just thought that it was the next step up and I'd put in the preparation at the end of... 60, well, between 65 and 67, I did a lot of gym work and mm -hmm. it paid off. You're famous for the Royce Hart style of marking, which was not jumping over the top of packs but floating across the front with that big stretch. I mean, does that go back to your high jumping days at school? Yeah, it goes back to high jump when I was uh, in Tasmania as a kid. And uh, my theory was that if the bigger player well, went to where the ball was going to go and I took a run up of about three or four metres and jumped in front of him, I'd be able to take the mark and it proved right. Tell me about the Peter Walker mark. Royce, I don't know if you think it's the best one that you've ever taken, but it's the most talked about, the most famous, isn't it? Well, it's the most critical time of the game. It was about the 20-minute mark of the uh, last quarter of in a grand final. In the 67 final. grand final. 67 yeah. grand final. Roy West kicks the ball in for Geelong. That's right, and about two minutes earlier, uh, the ball had gone over and Geelong took it down there into the ground. And it was just through sheer frustration to try and get the ball, so I ran in and... Peter Walker was there and I jumped on his shoulder for my recollection. Yeah, this, Martin Flanagan's done an account of that mark and, it, and created the impression that you put your foot up and sort of launched yourself from there. But you seem to me to just soar, just take off. I think I jumped on his shoulder. Yeah. That's my recollection, but it's a, it's a dim one because it was the last quarter of a grand final. Did you kick the goal? No, I kicked it up to Paddy Ganane, who thought, I think dropped the mark. Well, he, he dropped a few of them, Paddy, <laughs> didn't he? You were a superb kick for goal. It, it, obviously, there was no fear in you. When you went back, no, regardless of what the scoreboard pressure was, you had this belief that you could kick it. I did, and it came from the fact that before training, we used to have kicking for goal as part of the training, official training, kicking for goal as part of the official training session and marking, again, as part of the official training session. We'd get there at four o'clock and training wouldn't start until five and that's all we'd do. Your knees ruined, cut short your career, didn't ruin it, cut short your career. When did you first have problems with your knees? Oh, it'd be early 70s. I, 73? Um, 70, 73, I think. And I spent um, the last four or five training sessions in the gym rather than out in the ground with footballs. I suspect if, you, if we're talking about 73, 
and you're what age? 25 then? Something like that. Should have been at the peak of your powers, shouldn't you? That's right. Did you think that you lost X number of years? Because, I mean, did you see yourself being at your best when the knee problems came? I should have been at my best at that particular time, but those things happened and I had to uh, arrange my training routine around being able to play on a Saturday. So you still played in premierships in 73, 74. Heavily restricted? A bit restricted or what? Um, in 73, I think I uh, came on the ground at half time. I can remember playing Collingwood. Might have been the preliminary final. Yep. And we go in the room and Tom Hafey and Graham Richmond were in there and, uh, and, the, and the doctor. And um, Graham said... Uh, Tommy said, we better get Royce on, and the doctor said, well, he won't be able to play in the grand final if he comes on. And Graham pipes up and says, we won't get to the bloody grand final if he doesn't come on. <laughs> and that was true. <laughs> and that happened there. Uh, we won. Now, I'll tell you something you may not know. Dustin Martin, who inherited your number four at Richmond, is a ruck rover, and he's the, the height you were when you played centre-half forward. That surprised me when I read that, yes. He might play centre-half forward one day. <laughs> I don't think if he, he learns will. to jump. <laughs> I don't think he will. 72 grand final, Royce. You were a magnificent big occasion player, there's no doubt about that. But in that record breaking game for goals, I think there was 27 goals. Uh, the Blues kicked 27, didn't they? And you kicked 22? 22. That's right. Bruce Dool got you that day, didn't he? Yes, he did. But Bruce Dool was probably the best player I ever played on. Like early on in his career, he was a purely defensive player. But as time went on, he added a handball and running to his game and became an attacking player. He was the hardest player to play on. Why was he so good? Quick, very quick, surprisingly. And I think that was his main asset. Great balance? No hair. No. <laughs> Royce, when it started to go south because of your knees and you were getting on and it just didn't work, was that difficult for you to cope with given how supreme you'd been for the first six or seven years of your career? Well, I was probably lucky to go in there and play in a premiership in my first year. Yeah. So when the end came, I think I'd done enough, exceeded my expectations as to what I'd do and when the doctor said there was no guarantee of um, the knee coming right, I had little option. So you walked away content with what you'd done? Yes, I was yeah, pleased. Yeah. How are the knees now? Oh, they're OK. Just old age now, arthritis, yeah. things like that. You got a back problem? I've, yeah, I've got um, a bit of a back problem, but I mean... A bit of a one. It means you can't fly to Melbourne, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So what is, what's the problem? Sciatica going down my right leg, so... Uh, can't be remedied? Well, no guarantee of it being fixed. How long since you've been to the Big Smoke? Two years. Is it really? Do you miss it? Not really. I'm quite content down here. Oh, yeah? Peaceful lifestyle. Yeah, I want to quote you something that a good friend of yours and a beautiful football writer, Martin Flanagan, said of you. He, as in you, is Richmond's Tasmanian tiger. Much discussed but rarely seen. Uh, are you reclusive? No, not really. You're here. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking my tea. We, we go back 40 years, though. I know. But do you, do you mix? Are you social here? Oh, yes, I mix. Do you? But I don't go public. I find a lot of um, a lot of the players these days put themselves into positions where they set themselves up for trouble, and uh, I've always done it, and Richmond have always done that. And, um, like, players going out to nightclubs and uh, to all hours of the day, all, all hours of the night... It's just not my scene. and it never has been. I think you might have a memory lapse theory, <laughs> champ. I could. <laughs> I, think, I think I've seen you out after dark a few times in your younger days. That was in your dreams. <laughs> Coaching. You were seen to be one of the great players who went to coaching and didn't make it work. I mean, I know there were extenuating circumstances of Footscray and you had three and a half years there, did you not? Two and a half. Two and a half. Um, eight wins from 53 games. It's not a pretty record, is it? But no. what actually ha what, what happened? We probably didn't have the players there at the time. We had a recruiting budget, I can remember, for $75,000 in, in those days, and that would virtually buy one player. So we had to go out and get the Stephen McPherson, Stephen Wallace and Michael McLean's young players who were 16 and 17 and bring them across, and they ended up playing 200 games for the club. They did, but the problem was you were still Footscray's best player and you'd been retired four years. <laughs> <laughs> That's your 